Welcome to Community Connection Bible Study for Women. We are studying Timeless Treasures, a in-depth study of the book of Ephesians, called by some as a Grand Canyon of Scripture. I know you'll be excited as week by week you delve into these passages that tell us the wonderful blessings that we have in Christ. In fact, in the first chapter, the third verse, God says that He has blessed us in the heavenly places with every spiritual blessing in Christ. In Christ is a pivotal term there that He, Jesus, is the key to unlocking the treasures that we possess in Him. So my prayer for you is that as you see all that God has for you in His love and mercy, that you will be a changed woman as you go through this amazing book learning how much He loves you. This would be a great time for you to pause and to worship our great Savior through music. Heavenly Father, we want to sing before you as your daughters how great you are. Lord, you're great in the big ways by keeping the universe in place and, and sustaining nature. And yet, Lord, you care about the personal needs of your little girls. We just thank you, thank you, thank you for your greatness in the big ways and in the small ways. And Lord, as we study this lesson that is so near to your heart, I ask, O oh Holy Spirit, that you would be in our midst, that you would speak to us strongly, and that you prepare our hearts to do business with you. Lord, we invite you personally and quietly in the silent recesses of our heart to do business with us. Point out the areas that we need to hear this lesson, Lord. Work in us. Beautify us because we have contemplated this passage. So we invite you silently to speak to us. So we commit this teaching time to you now, Lord. I thank you for all the wonderful uh, interactions and um, buzz that was going on during small groups. Now, Lord, would you just continue teaching us as we uh, consider this passage of Scripture together. In Jesus' name, who made it all possible, in your name, Jesus, I make this prayer. Amen. Amen. Have a seat. Unless, of course, you want to stand the whole time. That'd be okay, too. <laughs> Well, it is just um, great to be with you this morning as we continue on in Lesson 11. And I just want to thank you all. As I look over this, this room, seeing um, you all, your consistency and your commitment to be here week after week, I just, that blesses me. You cannot know what a, an incredible blessing that is to see you all here week after week wanting to study the Word of God. That's just great. And if it blesses my heart, how much more the writer of the letter? You know, I don't know if you've ever received a love letter from somebody, hopefully your husband, and, um, or somebody dear to you. And can you imagine if, if somebody wrote you a letter and you went, oh, yeah, okay, it's from them. Plum. You put it away and you never took it out. You never looked at it. You thought, oh, well, maybe today I'll maybe, eh, I don't know. I'll, sometime I'll get to it. Can you imagine how the writer of that letter would be so disappointed? And so thank you for being here to read the letter every Tuesday. And I know sickness happens and, and um, commitments and all those kinds of things. But as you're able, thank you for being here. I, it just, it blesses me personally, your small group leader. And uh, also it blesses most especially it blesses the Lord. So thank you for being here. Today we are going to be talking about, lesson 11, living in unity. Living in unity. Now, does this kind of seem like a theme we've heard before? I mean, have we talked about unity a couple times as we've opened the book of Ephesians? I think, I just was struck by that as I was uh, once again kind of looking over this lesson 
this week and I thought, you know, we've heard this week after week. And so what, how it was so impressed on my heart was this has got to be this issue of unity within the body, <clears throat> unity with the barriers broken down, the mystery that we talked about um, earlier, the mystery revealed that all barriers are down in Christ and all. This has got to be very important to the heart of God that he is continuing repeatedly to talk about this issue of unity. Now, you know what? This is not the only book that talks about unity, is it? I mean, the Apostle Peter, we're going to be talking about some verses that he talks about later on. And I think the one that is the most impressive to my heart is um, chapter 17 of the book of John. And that is the scene where Jesus is at the Last Supper, and um, he's giving his disciples the last instructions. And then somewhere between uh, the Last Supper, it could have been right then there at the Last Supper, or somewhere between there and Gethsemane, Jesus prays this amazing prayer in chapter 17. Go home and read it. It's amazing the things that Jesus talks about in this. It's the, his final public prayer before he goes to Gethsemane and then to the cross. And so you can imagine the heaviness of um, what he's praying. You know, this is his last public, the, the last thing that anybody is going to hear him alive pray other than the, the few sentences that he makes on the cross. And so don't you know that it was very close to his heart. And three times in that prayer, Jesus prays for unity within his disciples. That is big. And so as we look at this concept, as we look at this idea of unity within the body, I want us to take it very seriously. And I was sharing with the small group leaders earlier that I had to you know, quickly do a little um, unity building uh, with Bob this morning, first thing. Six o'clock in the morning, I said, I'm so sorry about last night, you know. And he's kind of looking at me like, what? And he was barely awake, even though he's the morning one and I'm not the morning one. But, um, you know, we've got to take it seriously, not just the big things, but the little minute details that naturally pop up between people because we're fleshly people. We make mistakes all the time in our relationships, and this is so important to the heart of God, and so we need to take it very seriously. So having said all that, number one, introduction. The opening sentence in chapter 4, and we finally made it to chapter 4. Can you believe it? <laughs> Which just goes to show you how much amazing, you know, the depth of what is in this chapter. But the opening sentence in chapter 4 makes a turning point in the book of Ephesians. Listen to it. Listen to this verse, number one, uh, verse one, chapter four, and I'm going to read this in King James Version. Most of the time I'm reading in uh, NIV, New American, New International Version, but this one I loved in King, New King James. It says this, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, remember that concept we talked about a couple weeks ago, chained to God, not to the Roman soldier, prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. Now, um, obviously, he feels very deeply, the apostle feels very deeply about what he's going to begin to say because look at that word he uses. I what? Beseech you. Now, I, that's kind of an old-timey word. I don't think you go around saying, I beseech you, dear, to clean up your room, you know, to your children. Or, I beseech you to get out of my way on the uh, highway as I'm trying to make it to, to someplace. We don't, you, beseech is not one of those words that kind of just flows out in our, this day and age. But it's a deep word. It, other versions say, implore. That's a big one, too, isn't it? Um, urge is another one. Beg, that's maybe a more, you know, one of our generation type words. Um, or entreat is another word that, that uh, is used there. So it sounds as if he is truly trying to make an impression on his, he on his hearers. He's saying, I beseech you, as the prisoner of Jesus, you know, chained to God, I'm beseeching you, imploring you, begging, pleading with you to take this seriously. Now, what is he feeling so strongly about? Well, Look at the verse. He is feeling very strongly about us walking worthy of the calling. Worthy of the calling. Now, we're going to pick that apart and say, okay, what were you saying there? What are you beseeching us? If, if this is so important to you, um, Apostle Paul, really Holy Spirit, who inspired the pen of Apostle Paul, what is it that you feel so strong? What does it mean, worthy? What does it mean, worthy of the calling? 
the turning point here in chapter 4 is the Apostle Paul is going to move from theology to practicality. In the last three uh, chapters, he's been talking about doctrine, what we believe, what we know to be true about God. And so at this point, he moves from doctrine to duty. He moves from, you know, um, this is what we know and believe about God, and guess what? Now we're going to start putting it into to use. It's going to start being practical. It needs to begin to show up in the areas of our life. If we know this is true about God, then how can I live this out practically speaking? And he's beginning to embark from chapter 4 on through 6 about the practical living out of all these truths. This is going to be very where we live today uh, lessons from here on out. Talking about relationship, talking about um, the workplace even, talking about doing spiritual battle in a, in a world that doesn't understand the things of God. So from this point on, he's, he's going to be talking about our walk. Now, A on your, and remember the pivotal word, therefore. In other words, based on everything we've learned about God, all we have learned in chapter 1 through 3, therefore, as we know this to be true, therefore, now he's beseeching us, urging us, begging, pleading, entreating us to walk worthy of, of our call. Now, A, why should we work worthy? We just talked about it, really. Um, because we understand all these amazing things, that we, work, we walk worthy of the amazing timeless treasures that we possess that Jesus made possible by uh, dying on the cross because of all that, because of all the treasures we have that Jesus has unlocked by what he did on the cross. Now, because of that, based on that, that is why we are to walk worthy. Uh, what does worthy mean? Worthy, the original word, comes the root idea of weight. For example, to be of equal weight. It's almost like you know, on one, picture scale in your mind, those old time scales, you know, um, I think they still use them in Europe. They put this much stuff here and then you're supposed to pay this much or something. But you know what I'm talking about, those scales. Um, you've seen them in legal pictures. Um, and uh, it's almost like on this side of the scale is all that God has done for you. And then on the other side of the scale, we're going to put into it attempting <laughs> to live life worthy of all that God has given you. Now, I don't know, if, when, when I say that to you, do you feel a little bit inadequate? Does the weight suddenly go, voom, like that? And you think, Lord, there's so little in my side of the weight. I mean, this is so heavy, it, you know, it's going to make its way down into the ground. You know, but, and my side is so lightweight, sort of like a seesaw. You know, and mom, on the other side of a two-year-old, what happens? Boom! You know, the seesaw goes down with the weight of mom and the little child up. up. Where did that come from? I don't know. But anyway, <laughs> so the idea is that we should attempt to, to um, live lives equal to the great blessing that is described in chapter 1 through, through 1 through 3. Now, someone said, Christ has done so much for me that the rest of my life is a P.S., to his great work. Isn't that a neat comment? I love that. P.S. to the, re uh, the rest of his work. Now, can we ever be worthy? Can the scales ever balance? Never. Never, never. Because we are human. We are flesh. And I don't know about you, but I make mistakes every day in my life. But here's the neat thing. You see, Jesus accomplished the worthy. The destination is secure. It is done. Uh, we will never be worthy in our own strength. But because Jesus took our unworthiness, died for them, now we are worthy. And now our destination is in place. So our responsibility is the getting to the destination. Our responsibility is the journey. Our responsibility is attempting. Our responsibility is to have that goal in place, saying, God, you know, the scales will never equal out except that you, Jesus, did it. But my responsibility is to put one foot in front of the other and walk worthy. Attempt 
in every way that I can to yield myself to the Holy Spirit, to give me the strength to make the scales a little bit more equal every day. They'll never equal out except that Jesus accomplished it. But my responsibility is to do everything that I can each day. If I couldn't at least make an attempt to walk worthy, the Holy Spirit would never uh, um, have never inspired the apostle to write those words, would he? If it weren't my responsibility to determine and choose to walk worthy, then he would have never, you know, encouraged me to do that or never inspired the Paul, Paul to write that. So we're not to sprint to the finish line. We are to walk every single day. This morning I get up and I do my very best to walk worthy of my calling. Tomorrow I say, Lord, forgive me for that, that moment um, Yesterday when I lost it or was unkind or said the wrong thing or my tongue got too loose and forgot to stay behind the picket fence. And um, forgive me for that. And Lord, today I want to do a little bit better. Holy Spirit, convict me when I'm about to say something or do something that would offend you because you know what? You've done so much for me. I am so grateful for all you've done. So now may my life reflect all of this that you have done for me. Now, the first way that he begins to talk to us about walking worthy of our calling is in the area of what we've already talked about, unity. The first way that we can put one foot in front of the other in the journey of, of, um, of walking, living out the blessings that I possess is through unity. B, what are the characteristics what are the characteristics? This subject is so important to us today, not only because of what we talked about a minute ago about how near and dear it is to the Lord's heart, but also because we live, and we've talked about this in the weeks past, in such an isolated and alienated culture. We live in a culture that, you know, we talked about, was it last week, where, you know, we've taken the front porches off where we used to, you know, hang out with our neighbors, and we put the porches on the back, put cages around them, and alienated. And so people are alone today. Children are lonely. The small group leaders, as we met earlier to pray for, for this time together, we talked about how children feel so alienated today and, and are lost, so many of them, in what's going on. So we really live in an isolated, alienated uh, time. And so this is so important that we, the body of Christ, exemplify unity to a world that doesn't understand it. I heard about a young man who was so starved for attention that he went to have his hair cut once a week to be touched by another human being. Isn't that pitiful? That's a true story. Or there's this little woman in my life, and you all have stories like this. There's a little lady that was um, uh, uh, attended a church where Bob was a, an interim a while ago, and she was a single lady, probably in her 70s, and she was so starved for touch because she was single that she would just wait in the foyer of that church every week to get her hug from Bob and her hug from me when I was there. Just desperate. We are desperate for relationship in our culture today. And, uh, and we need to be aware, aware of that. This world is looking for, remember, new nationality, the new nationality we are. We're not Americans or Germans or English. We're Christians. Yeah, Christians. They're looking for this new nationality, this new mankind that is not only walking in unity with each other, but doing so with open arms and open hearts. That's what the world is looking for. And as we get more and more successful with that within the body, the more we're going to be able to minister and draw in that community out there that doesn't experience that like we do and should. So um, beginning with unity. This unity and this unity begins with character. Look with me to verse 2 and 3. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient bearing one another in love, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. I feel convicted already, do you? Okay, let's see what, what the Holy Spirit is saying through the Apostle Paul. First of all, people who bring unity are first 
and foremost, humble. Humble. Number one on your outline, humility. Now, humility in the ancient world that Paul lived, um, did, this world did not look upon the, this trait as good character. Isn't that interesting? The Roman thought that humility was weakness. They didn't say, wow, what an amazingly humble person. They, they just considered humility a, a weakness and sort of like slave-like or something. But the Bible, however, has verses full of the need for humility and many verses that warn, warn, warn strongly against pride and lack of humi humility. Whew. See, I can't even say it, let alone live it. But anyway, in fact, I found 54 references to pride and arrogance in the Bible. 54, and that was just a quick perusal in the back of a, com back of a, uh, a concordance. If we really dug, wow, what would we find? That's how important it is to God. Uh, pride and arrogance is not, uh, will not pr pr produce unity within the body. Jesus himself was such an example of the attribute of humility. Listen, you don't have to look it up, but jot it down. Philippians 2.8, listen to this. And being found in appearance as a man, he, talking about Jesus, humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on the cross. You know what? If the King of Kings, Lord of Lords, the Creator of the universe, God Almighty, Ancients of Days, um, El Elyon, El Shaddai, the Mighty One, the Ancient of Days, if He can be humble, where do I get off being arrogant and prideful? Right? Absolutely. Jesus Himself displayed for us, illustrated, mentored, taught us to be humble. And as we're humble, then unity will grow. Closely related to humility and coupled with it is, two on your outline, gentleness. Gentleness or meekness is another way to uh, translate. Meekness is not weakness. Let me say that again. Meekness is not weakness. In fact, in the original language, it indicates strength under control. Meekness or gentleness, as it's used in this passage, means strength under control. The imagery is this. I want you to think about a wild stallion running wild in the West. I don't know if they still have you know, herds of wild horses, but I know they did. They do? Somebody said yes? Okay. Wild horses. Think about somebody corralling one of those stallions who's never experienced a bit or a saddle or a harness or a corral. And you've seen movies of that, you know, where they get one in the corral and they're, you know, rearing up and, you know, bucking and all those kinds of things. And finally, after much, much work of training and working and, and little by little putting a saddle on the back of the horse and, you know, putting the bit in its mouth, finally, that stallion submits to the control of his owner. You've seen movies like that. We all have. That is the idea. You see, that horse has now become meek. That horse has now become gentle. It's not that he doesn't have strength within his body. No, he has decided a choice of his to submit to the bit in his mouth. That is the picture. That is what God is calling to us in this area of unity, not only to be humble, but to be under control of God. He doesn't want us to give up our strength, and he doesn't want us to, you know, become little, you know, wimpy, you know, whining, mamby-pamby, whatever. He wants us to be strong in who we are in Christ, but he wants it to be under his control. We need to put the bit in our mouth when it comes to relating to each other to, in, in the area of building unity. Jesus himself, I love this, described himself in both of those words in Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29. He said, I am gentle or meek, and humble in heart. He described himself that way. Now, do you think of Jesus as a weak little? Absolutely not. He was steely strong, but he submitted to the bit of the Heavenly Father. And so, therefore, he was not only gentle meek slash meek and humble because he chose to do that. 
and he is the example, the mentor for us in our lives. Two ways we see it in his life. First, um, he was, first in respect to himself, he was totally in control at all times. I think the neatest picture to me of the control that Jesus had, if you saw The Passion, the movie, and you see how unbelievably controlled, beaten, um, almost to the point of, of dying before he even got to the cross, and as he stands before um, Pilate, and Pilate says, this is your chance, redeem yourself, tell me who you are, what are you doing, is this true what they're saying? And he was open-minded, Pilate, Suppo seemed like he was. And yet what did Jesus do? Never, ever, ever said a word except a sentence or two. Herod, when he was before Herod, never even opened his mouth because he knew that that man was not listening. Totally in control of himself. Never, ever retaliated or said anything or he was completely in control with himself but the second picture is he was unbendingly tough when it came to defending the truth or the underdog and the, of course the famous picture is the cleansing of the temple I love that picture of the Lord oh I just love it because I think about times in our culture where if he were here he would have cleansed the temple don't you know situations like that Absolutely. And so I love that tough picture of him. When it was about somebody else, boy, he was ready to go. And he got in there with his little whip and just, you know, made short work of those people, knocked everything over. I love it. So we see that meekness, the gentle slash meek, humble spirit of the Lord himself. And he's saying, hey, if you follow me, if you're my followers, then I want to see those same character traits working in your life so that you can be unified with your other sisters and brothers within the body. Pride and arrogance produce disunity because why? The focus is on me. When I'm prideful and arrogant it's because, hey, you know, hey, did you forget about me? You know, aren't, aren't, you aren't focusing on my needs or my issues. Pride and arrogance comes from an overabsorption with self. And that is so, uh, so, what's the word I want? Such not a, a picture of the way we're supposed to be as followers of Jesus. We need to exemplify him. A humble, gentle spirit is as refreshing as a drink of cold water on an August day in each other's lives. When we see that humbleness, that, that strength under control in another sister or brother within the body, as far as we're concerned, it, it, in our air, as far as unifying with us, it's such a refreshing picture. I love this verse, Romans 12, 3. Do not think of yourselves more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourselves with sober judgment. Don't you love that? In accordance with the measure of faith God has given you. In other words, you know, we are quick to jump to sober judgment about other people. Let me just tell you, this person really needs to get this area of their life straight. Well, I'm struggling with some little area in my own life. I'm supposed to have sober judgment about me, about the areas that I need to work on. That's the picture here, that we are to not think more highly of ourselves or not, don't think too much about yourself either, as far as that goes, according to this verse. If we have the correct perspective of myself, not so much my self-importance, but have sober judgment, that will bring a healthy focus on my relationship with others, and that builds unity. Let me give you an example. A couple years ago, many couple years ago, um, when Bob and I probably, oh, I don't know, when we first started speaking together on the marriage, and we went to uh, do a... Um, we were asked to do a marriage seminar for some young pastors and missionaries of a particular denomination. We were very young, just started speaking on marriage, and the couple, and if I told you their names, they, you would know them, and so I'm not going to say them, even though I'm so tempted to tell you who it is. But, you know, I mean, <laughs> unity, unity, uh, humility, and all that. <laughs> anyway, this older couple who had been speaking much longer than we had, they had been asked, we had been asked to do marriage, they had been asked to come and do devotions for this group of pastors and missionaries. 
And so I think they were a little disgruntled that we were the ones that got to speak on marriage because they had been speaking about marriage themselves and they were asked to do devotions. And so we were just so thrilled to see this couple because we've been hearing and read their books and everything. And um, when we, we, so the first morning they were doing, sharing their devotions, we went in and we snuck in, we sat down in the back and we're just, ooh, ooh, you know, all that, just so pumped. And um, they began starting. They said, you know, uh, this afternoon we have... A, a couple of young whippersnappers, and I quote, young whippersnappers coming in to talk about marriage. And I don't know the rest of what they said. They probably may have even said, oh, please pray for them. I don't know what they said, but that was enough to undo me. And I got back to the, to the room, and I said, well, I can't possibly go and speak now. I'm a young whippersnapper. And I just was just totally came unglued, and it almost caused me to not be able to do what God had called us to do. In contrast, about a month later, we went to a church in um, Atlanta, and the pastor there, and I'm going to tell you his name, Pastor Bolden. See, I'm going to tell you him because he was wonderful. And he was probably in his 60s. He was kind of getting close to retirement. And he sat Bob and I down. He said, listen, you guys, thank you for being here. Thank you for sharing your heart about marriage. I want you to know I've been praying for you for months. I know you're going to bless my people. What can I pray about for you about? And it was such an amazing contrast between the pride and the arrogance and the meekness and humility. It was dramatic. And when I was able, when I stood up, to that, that podium, I felt energized. I felt able to do what God had called me to do because of that spirit of that beautiful pastor. He is still will always be special to my heart because of the encouragement, that humble. Could he have stood up there and talked about marriage? Oh, my goodness. He could have spoken rings around us. We were, we were young whippersnappers. And, uh, <laughs> but yet he encouraged with his humbleness and with his uh, meekness, his strength under control. Patience, number three on your outline. Back to the verse. Patience, bearing with one another in love. There is a true story about a church split that was so serious that each side uh, filed lawsuits and caused the church property to be split and rewarded to one faction of the church split. Isn't that a heartbreak? And then the other uh, faction had to go and start a new church. Let me tell you, how it started. At a church dinner, one of the leadership was sitting next to a small child. True story. Was sitting next to a uh, small child. And the, the child got a larger piece of ham than the man in leadership. That was it. That's how the split happened. That's how everybody got mad at each other. That's how there was all kinds of bickering and complaining. And, Did you know that? Blah, 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 and all the phone calls and everything. It caused a lawsuit. Split the church in half. <laughs> one got the property. One did over a piece of ham. Oh, my goodness. Are our fuses that short? Are we that small? Lord, please, may we never be that way. May we be patient with one another. You know, so often the very problems that become huge within the body are over small little things because of our lack of patience with each other. With the lack of patience over nonsense, <laughs> lack of patience over the fact that we're all flesh and we're all going to make mistakes. You know, when I get perfect, then I can judge you. But you know what? I'm not going to get per perfect until I meet Jesus, cross over into the other realm. That's when I'll be perfect. And so until that time, then I better be focused upon me rather than be focused on you. We need to be patient, patient with one another. I don't want to be the pawn of the enemy. He loves to do that thing. He loves to say, have you heard about so-and-so? Is that annoying that we have to this and that? The enemy loves to sow discord, disharmony, and it's usually over trash. I don't want to be a pawn. So when my ears start hearing this stuff, I want to say, get thee behind me, Satan. I do not want to hear it. I don't want to go there. I, I want to be patient because here's the thing. 
I want you to be patient with me, you know, in my little areas. So if I want you to be patient with me, then I've got to learn to be patient with you as well. And that goes for within the family, small family unit, and within the big family, the church family unit. Number four, fourth one, tolerance. The verse goes on, bearing one another in love. Love <coughs> is um, like oil in our relationship. We're to be tolerant of our differences and not just tolerant, but tolerant to the point of respecting, even revering, even edifying our temperaments and gift differences. Helen and I were talking at a small group a minute ago, and we were talking about how each other's gift, area of gifting, is very intimidating for the other one. I said, there is no way I could do some of the things that you do. And, and that's the way it's supposed to be. But you know what? I'm not supposed to point my finger and say, why would you be in interested in that? Why aren't you interested in this? In fact, let me tell you a story about myself. Um, in another church where I taught a while ago, there was a leader in that church amongst the women. And she never came to Bible study. And that used to annoy me. I used to think, why don't you come? I'll even let you teach if you want to. Why aren't you involved? It turned out that she had the gift of prayer. That was her Holy Spirit gifting. In one of the lists, prayer is one of them. She was a prayer warrior, and that was her heart. And she would spend hours and hours a week in prayer. That was what she did. And so here I was judging her because she didn't get involved in the area that was my passion. She had her own passion. And you see, that's the way God puts us together. And that's how we have a balanced per, uh, church balanced body is when she's passionate about prayer, I'm passionate about teaching or uh, about the word of God, somebody else is passionate about caring for the fellowship, meeting those needs of hurt, taking a meal, somebody else is passionate about ministering to children, somebody else is passionate to, about uh, uh, ministering to youth. You see what happens? We blend together, and the church becomes balanced. We need to be so careful of not only bearing with each other, but getting pumped up about each other's area, saying, good for you. I'm glad we have administrators in our midst because there is no way that I personally could do administration. So thank you, Lord, for the gifts that you've provided. Getting excited about the temperamental and gifting differences that all of us have. Here's another. Just jot these down. You don't, we don't have to look them up, but... Same verses, same concepts from the heart of another apostle, Peter. Listen to this. This is 1 Peter 1, 22. Have sincere love for your brothers. Love one another deeply from the heart. 1 Peter 2, 17. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the brethren of the, of the believers. Fear God. Honor the king. 1 Peter 3, 8. Finally, all of you live in harmony with one another. Be sympathetic. Love his brothers. Be compassionate and humble. 1 Peter 4.8. Above all, excuse me, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. Do you see? Here's one apostle that wrote to a, a certain group. Here's another apostle that wrote to another group. You see the heart of God? It's just coming out all over the place within the Bible. He's saying, love each other. Live in unity over and over and over again. I've got to get this message. It's so important to the Father. Next one, next character trait of living in unity is five, peace. Look at verse 3 again. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit throughout the bond of love. Make every effort. comes from the word, uh, root word, word, make haste. Make haste. In other words, this is urgent. This is urgent business because you know why? The church is an urgent business, isn't it? What we are dealing with is forever life-changing issues. And as, as we look at the world around us and all the things that are going on, we know that time is short. So it is urgent. We need to be diligent about finding out what God is having to say to us because um, it becomes more and more urgent with every, uh, every passing day. Our world is looking for us to be salt and light. So we need to be modeling before them the life of and through Jesus. What does the Lord's life look like? And how do we do it through him is what the world is looking, looking uh, at. Notice it says, make every 
effort. Make an effort. In other words, peace is an action word. Peace doesn't just happen. We can't just sit back and say, oh, Lord, you just have peace upon this place. No. It, we have to make it happen. It is an action word. Remember, those of you who uh, studied the Sermon on the Mount a few years ago, remember it was blessed are the peace makers. Make. It's not peace keepers. A peacekeeper is one that says, okay, I don't like conflict. I don't want to mess with this. I might get hurt. I might, somebody might misunderstand me, so I'll just be quiet. That's a peacekeeper. Jesus said, be a peacemaker. And will it, might it be painful? It might. Because when we're making peace, we are risking being misunderstood. We are risking conflict. We are risking um, uh, uh, having somebody not understand where we're coming from. So yes, it is, there is a risk of pain. But we must make peace if we want to develop the character and if we're called to walk worthy of his calling. If we're to be walking, if we're to be, you know, making that journey towards praising God for that balance scale for all he's done for, for me, then you know what? It's worth the pain to make peace with my brothers and sisters within the body. <clears throat> making peace calls for action. Also cares for, calls for care and discernment as we deal with confrontation for growth. There's an uh, acquaintance of mine that she's really good on the making peace part of it. She'll say, hey, I will speak my mind and I will have it heard. And she is quick to let you know what her opinion is. But notice what it says. It says, going back to that verse, make every effort to bring unity through the bond of peace. Another verse, Galatians 6, 1. Brothers, if someone is caught in sin, you who are spiritual should restore gently. Restore gently. Yes, we take action. Yes, we express our opinions, but we do, we do restoration with gentleness, with lovingness, by slowly, it's almost like, you know, picture almost a, a cord or a string on that person, and you're gently reeling them back with love, and, you know, do you really think you should think that way, and, you know, I, I don't know, what does the Bible say, you know, I love you, and I might be wrong, da, 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 you know, reeling them in, pulling them in gently, carefully. We don't just say, get in here, get this right. And sometimes, you know, we have that temptation, gently, lovingly restore with peace as the goal. Now, thank goodness for this part. See, how is this possible? Aren't you ready for this part? Oh, my, me too. Here it is. Verses 4 through 6, there is one body in one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who over all and through all in all. A lot of alls there. First of all, what is that saying? How is this possible? One, first the creating of the Holy Spirit. He creates the body of Christ. He's the one that put a, you know, a, a need in your heart, a desire to know the Lord Jesus and, and then open the doors for you. And, you know, if we went around, it would be so cool to hear everybody's story of how they came to the Lord. But the Holy Spirit was the one that prodded you there and, and taught, told you, whispered in your ear that there was a need in your life. And so he's the one that creates. He's the one that indwelt you at conversion. He's the one that empowers. He's the one that orchestrates the church. And here's the neat thing. It's a cross-denominational and this is what we've been studying in the last weeks, across racial, denominational, uh, national lines, isn't it? That there is, that we are all a part of the church of God. The Holy Spirit began that work, creating the body of Christ by creating our relationship with the Lord, first of all. I used to be very, very stuck in denominational lines. This is another confession. This is a true confession time for Rosemary this morning. I can tell that. But anyway, you know, I, I thought, you know, if a person didn't worship the Lord the way I did, hmm, could they really be Christians? Could this really? I don't know. And then God 
orchestrated an area of growth opportunity by giving Bob and me the opportunity through uh, Sheridan House Ministries to go across denominational lines. And it was very shocking for me and an eye-opener when I would go into a church and I'd think to myself in a very judgmental sort of way, I'd think, you know, this is going to be too stuffy or uh, ritualistic here. You know, they, how could they really be Christians? Because they're kind of stuck in there. Hmm. And what would happen is what the Lord would do is he would have me encounter vibrant, creative Christians. And so I began to understand, you know what? If we are worshipers of Jesus Christ, how we worship him is everybody's business, isn't it? We worship, I love the way Bob, my husband, puts it. He says, how you worship is your envelope. And isn't that true? We all have our ways because we're all different. You know, my children are different. One of, one of my children is, you know, just out there and blah, blah, all the time, where other one is much more calm and deliberate. And, you know, uh, one of their walks is very emotional. One's kind of plodding along and checking all the scriptures and getting everything straight. Very different. But do they love the Lord as much as each other? Absolutely. And so we've got to be that way as well as we encounter different Christians across um, denominational lines. Going back to Japan my home uh, as a little girl. That was another eye-opener to me. Here was a totally different culture. And so they worship the Lord Jesus in a very different way because they're a different culture. They're not alike Americans. And as you encounter other cultures, um, you know, Peggy's been talking about this mission trip to India. I'm sure the Indian women worship God in a very different way. Does that make them wrong? No, different. We worship in different envelopes. So that unity that we need to um, have with one another because the Holy Spirit created the church to, through the ministry of the Son, capital S, it is about Jesus. That's the tie. That's the thing that, that uh, 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 b binds us together. One Lord, he, as our one Lord, he creates one faith, as diverse as we are, as different as we are as women, as, as nationalities, as um, you know, denominations, as all those things, we are one Lord. We're very diverse. But as long as he is the same and he is the object and focus of our belief, then we are one in Christ Jesus. He is our Savior. He is a, gives us the same hope. We have the same faith. Um, and finally, see in this section, through the work of the Father, through the work of the Father. The emphasis here is, and we've talked about this in the weeks past, that we have the same Father. Our Father planned all this before time began itself. The Father knew that when he created mankind that they were going to need a Savior because he created them with a free will. And so he knew that as we were had a free will that we were going to have a sin problem. And so he created and came up with the plan of the Lord Jesus before the world itself was created so that we would be one family together with fa the Father is our Father. We, we have the same Father. That, that means that we get to be sisters, doesn't it? In my quad at college, I, I lived with one girl, one twin. She had a, a twin sister, and, and this one lived with me. And when they first came to school, they were so identical that you could not, in a million years, figure out who was what, which. They talked alike, they had the same gestures, they parted their hair the same way, they wore the identical clothes, and were constantly saying, Emmy Arini, Emmy Arini, trying to figure out who it was. But as they began to grow as women, being on a college campus, one lived in one dorm, one in the other, which was probably a very wise thing, <clears throat> as they began to grow, their interests and their giftings became, were very different. And as they began to grow into being who God wanted them to be, they became so different. Their tastes, their um, activities were so different that they became, even started looking different. And by the time they graduated, we all graduated together my senior year, they did hardly look like sisters. They were so different very different, very different uh, interests, and yet they were sisters, in fact, twin sisters. Didn't look like it, but they were. 
That's the same concept within the body. We have one Father. Very different. We're very diverse, aren't we? And yet, we have the same Father. Perhaps, you know, I, why do you think God designed it that way? Why do you think God made us so different? It would have been a lot easier for all of us if we were all like-minded, we had the same gifts, we all got excited and passionate about the same thing. Wouldn't it be a lot easier? There would be a lot less conflict, wouldn't there? But here's the thing. Yeah, boring. I love that. Absolutely. It would be very boring. But God designed us differently to strengthen the whole. There is no greater example than the marriage relationship. Those of you who are married, you know that your husband and you are as different as you could possibly be. Bob and I are an example of two people that could not be more different in every single way. Male and female, go no further. But we will. Backgrounds. <laughs> you know, I, he's German. I'm Danish. He, you know, he's punctual. I'm always late, at least five <laughs> minutes. He's thrifty. I'm a spendthrift. He, he's a morning person. I'm a night person. Um, he plans very carefully. I'm carefree. Who wants to plan? That is so boring. Let's just go live. <laughs> you know, he's a homebody. I love to travel. He, um, you know, he likes order and routine. I like none. He loves sports. I like to read. I mean, could I go on for the rest of the morning? There, I don't think there's one thing that we really have in common other than we love each other and we love the Lord. We're very, very different. But here's the thing. It is so neat because we, when we begin to get past the conflicts that that causes, when we begin to work together, we are such a strong one because we bring the opposite perspective. Isn't that neat? Yes, we become a strong team. We bring to the table such a different perspective, uh, dimension, and texture to our lives because we are so different. If we were the same, it would be so boring. If I were just like him, oh my goodness, talk about yawn. But if we, if we were just like me, we'd never accomplish anything. We'd be out there somewhere. You know, never getting anywhere on time, never planning or anything. So the whole, that's the whole point, that God designed us to be different within the body, within this family, in the same way, so that we could bring dimension, perspective, texture to the body of Christ. Number three, what are the building blocks of unity? And we're almost done here. If we're so different in the body, if there is... Um, uh, for, and if for the benefit of the body, if we are to share, and if our focus, is in hope, uh, our focus is of one hope and one Lord, what do we do with that practically? How do we live that out? What does that mean? Well, A, we, there's a need for living out our spiritual gifts. And I know you all studied that and, over the week and then discussed it in your small groups. But look with me to lesson uh, verses 7 through 11. But to each of us, uh, of each of us grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, and this is quoting, he descended on high and he led the captains in his, captives in his train and gave gifts to men. What does he descended mean except that he also descended to the or, or lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended higher, talking about going to heaven, than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. Verse, and here it is. It was he, this one who descended and then ascended into the heavenly places, um, who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors and teachers. The teaching of this passage is that all of us who know the Lord Jesus personally, every one of us, without exception, has a serving grace. Notice at the beginning, each of us grace has been given by Christ Jesus. And then it goes on to say in verse um, where is it? Uh, end of eight. Gave gifts to man. We all have a servi serving grace. We've talked about this in the weeks past. There is a special job for every one of us who know the Lord Jesus personally as our Savior. We have a job to do for the kingdom. We all have something to do. And here's the neat thing. Not only does he give us a job, but not only as he gives us the job, 
2 Corinthians 9, 8, I just love this verse. I live in this verse. I rely on this verse. Pray this verse. Uh, chapter 9, uh, verse 8. 2 Corinthians 9, 8. And God is able to make all grace abound to you so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. Is that an amazing verse? In other words, he has given each of us a job to do for the kingdom, but as he gives that job, he pours grace in our lives to be able to do the job. We don't have to sit out there and say, oh my goodness, I've got to teach this week. Oh, help. Well, I do do that. But, <laughs> but uh, we, he is there to help. He's there to empower us. He's there to pour grace upon us so that we can actually do the very things that he has called us to do. Now, there are many grace gifts that we're to exercise. He only listed, what, uh, four of them here. But there are several other passages, four lists exactly, uh, to be exact, besides this. 1 Corinthians 12, 8 through 10. Romans 12, 28 through 30. Romans 12, 6 through 8. And 1 Peter 4, uh, 4 11. Here and here he just talks about the four gifts, but what we're supposed to do, the point of this is that we are to find out, okay, Lord, you have saved me. You've become my savior. And now I need to know what my job is for the kingdom. And so what we need to do is diligently study and figure it out. How do we do that? Well, we pour over these passages of Scripture. We ask wise counsel. We pray about We say, Lord, what is it that you have for me to do? What is my little corner of the kingdom that you have for me to do? If you're a mother, you need to go no further. The first ministry is your children, bringing them to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. That's your first ministry right there. But there are other things as well that God has gifted you personally to do for his sake. And so we need to be about finding out that. B, the results of living out our spiritual gifts. Look at the beginning of verse 12. To prepare God's people for the works of service. When we are executing our, our gifts, then ministry will take place within the body. It's a it's We're becoming a better us. You see, if, if every, all the teachers are teaching, all the visionaries are casting vision, all the mercy gifts are saying, oh, there are needs. We've got to get dinner to that one, and we've got to do this. We've got to visit that one in the hospital. This one is sick. Let's, let's, um, let's put together a quilt for that person who's ministering. As the mercy people are functioning, as the administrators are ministrating and saying, let's get some order here. Let's get a game plan. Here's how we can execute the plan. As those gifts are being exercised within the body of Christ, what happens? Ministry happens, and the church moves forward in a beautiful, well-oiled, balanced machine. It's a beautiful, beautiful picture. Our focus is on our job and doing it through the Holy Spirit the best that we can, and that will bring balance to the ministry within the body. We've got to keep our eyes off of other people. So you know, we have the tendency of doing one of two things. Either we say, oh, I wish I had her gift. Oh, God, why didn't you let me be able to minister? You know, I'm just so bummed out that I, I can't do that. Or we do the other thing. You know, I get to do this. And why doesn't she get excited about what I'm doing? You know, we can go to the other, to either extreme, and we need to be careful. We've got to get our eyes on ourselves and say, okay, God, what do you have for me to do? Let my focus be on that. Let me be the best me in my job that I can be. That's the focus. See, goal, and we're done, of living out our spiritual gifts. Look with me, the second part of 12 through 14, so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity, there it is, in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become, here it is, mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ, that we will no longer be infants, tossed back and forth by the waves, blown here and there, by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of men in their deceitful scheming. You see, the goal is maturity. We all have to grow up. we got to grow up. We got to put past all this childish thing. We, you know, I love the way he described um, 
with every back and forth by the waves, blown here and there. You know, isn't childishness, part of childishness, indecisiveness? Haven't you seen that in your children? I remember particularly had one child that was so indecisive. This child could not, would spend a half an hour trying to decide whether to wear, you know, brown or green socks. Just, just absolutely debilitated <coughs> by making a decision. That's a, a sign of immaturity that we, we are blown around. You know, we're blown around by teachings. We're blown around by the next fad that comes into the Christian community. We're blown away by, oh, have you read this book? This is life-changing. Blown away. Paul says that as we mature, we need to be steady in focus on what? Unity and growth in Christ, as the verse says. Our common goal is to constantly be growing deeper in the understanding of him. Number four, summarizing quickly the treasure we possess first we belong a to one another i love this verse romans 12 5 expresses it so beautifully so in christ we who are many we're talking about the differences form one body and each member belongs to all the others you know what that means that means that what i have been gifted by the holy spirit to do belongs to you and the gift that you have that was given to you by the Holy Spirit belongs to me. That we owe each other our gifts. And as, we're, as I give you my gift and you give me your gift, then we just have this amazing, flowing, wheel-turning, um, you know, this well-oiled, beautiful thing that happens. And then ultimately what happens? B, we grow up. We grow up. Instead of speaking Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head, that is Christ. From him the whole body, joined together and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Isn't that a beautiful picture? As we're exercising our gifts, we promote growing up in him who is the head, that is in Christ. Isn't that great news? We don't have to be infants anymore begging for the bottle in our high chair. We can start growing. We can start becoming mature women in Christ as we um, go forward in doing what God has called us to do through unity. Oh, grow up. <laughs> Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that you put up with us. <laughs> Thank you, Lord, that you give us teaching like, like teachings like this that help us to uh, see ourselves as we are, to long to walk worthy as being called by you. Thank you, Lord, that as we decide that we desire and we choose to put one foot in front of the other in our walk toward you, that you made us worthy. It's not anything we did. Oh, my goodness, we could not be worthy, but you made us worthy. And then, Lord, you give us the strength to do what we need to do, that you've given us a job for the body and then the strength with which to carry it out. You don't just let us give us a gift and just say, go do it. You give us the strength to do it. That's just amazing. How do you love us so much, Lord? And, Lord, forgive us for the times we act like babies, indecisive, floating around, back and forth, Help us to deeply desire to grow in the things of the Lord. I thank you for these women who consistently, week after week, come here because that is their goal. They want to become mature women for you and in you, for you, so that a world out there can look in and say, wow, there's something different about that woman. I want what she has. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you've gifted us, given us the self-esteem of having a job to do for the kingdom's sake. Lord, you could snap your fingers and do every bit of it yourself, but you have chosen to allow us to, have, to play a part in your kingdom work. What a blessing. We love you. We are grateful. And, Lord, may we walk worthy of our calling, and may we grow up. Thank you, Lord. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.